The Christmas tree is not ancient. Maybe you've heard the custom is rooted in the ancient festival Saturnalia, a Roman holiday celebrated in late December. Or maybe you've heard it originates from Norse mythology, from the old Norse world tree Yggdrasil. Or maybe the Yule log inspired it. But the reality is the Christmas tree appears somewhat suddenly in the late medieval period, long after the Roman Empire, long after the Christianization of the Germanic peoples. And while historians don't really know for sure why the practice emerged and how it caught on, they do have a pretty good idea of when and where. So what is the absolute earliest evidence we have for decorating an evergreen tree for Christmas? For that, let's turn to medieval forest management law the best kind of forest management law. I know, I spoil you on this channel. This is Dr. Laszlo Lucas, a scholar of European folklore and ethnography, and in my opinion, the leading expert on the origins of the Christmas tree, even though he's never cited in any of the English language publications I found while researching this topic. Back in 2014, he published this article, in which he argues that the immediate predecessor of the Christmas tree originated from right here, the upper Rhine regions of Alsace and what's now eastern France, and Baden, which is now the western part of the modern German state of Baden-Württemberg. This whole region was heavily forested with evergreen trees, especially the black forest on the east bank of the Rhine River. And suddenly, starting in the 1300s, evidence starts to emerge that indicates peasants were going into the forests on Christmas Eve to collect wood from these forests. We know this because forestry regulations from the 1300s in the cities of Sundhofen and Bergheim permit people to collect branches before or around Christmas. Landowners were trying to regulate these forests, and apparently people were also trying to steal wood from them. According to a legal directive from the 1300s, the judge of saint hippolyte now located in France, ordered the forest to be guarded for nine days before and after Christmas. We can infer that this was an attempt to stop people from stealing wood from the local forest, not only during Christmas, but also the following festivals of New Year and Epiphany. Now, these regulations don't say why the wood was being collected. Dr. Lucas says it's possible that the branches were simply burned as firewood or fed to animals. But the fact that these regulations specifically mention Christmas leads him to assume that this wood collecting was part of a wider practice. I want to be clear that these forestry regulations are not direct evidence that people were cutting down evergreen trees and decorating them for Christmas. But they are direct evidence that at least by the early 1300s, people in the Upper Rhine region were conifer curious, collecting branches at Christmas time from mostly evergreen forests. Maybe the branches were being used for decoration. Again, this is not explicitly mentioned in these sources, but it's not a bad assumption based on what follows in the next century. It's not until the 1400s that direct evidence emerges for some sort of decorated Christmas tree, right here in the Upper Rhine city of Freiburg. According to the author Bernd Brunner, who published an academic book about the Christmas tree with Yale University Press, a guild of bakers in Freiburg reported seeing a tree decorated with apples, wafers, gingerbread, and tinsel in a local hospital in 1419. 1419. This is the earliest reference historians can find for a decorated Christmas tree, or a decorated Christmas pole. Bruno warns us that the middle low German word used here, Baum, could also refer to a pole, and not specifically a tree. In fact, Dr. Lucas considers that the direct predecessor of the Christmas tree was the Maypole, tall wooden poles that were known to be set up during festivals in medieval Europe. Starting the 1400s, towns and landowners in the Alsace region started to issue laws limiting the number and size of trees you could cut down during Christmas. At least a few of these edicts specifically mention maypoles. A 1431 law from the town of Adelsheim allows cutting down a pine tree as tall as 7 feet for Christmas. And a forestry regulation from Amershwyer dating to 1448 specifically says that each citizen is only allowed to cut down one maypole for Christmas, and it can't be any longer than 8 feet. So we're no longer talking about branches here. 7 or 8 feet is a pretty big pine tree, indicating that people were starting to set up bigger trees in public. And it's here in the 1400s that the tradition seems to have exploded and rapidly spread outward from the Upper Rhine region. Not only do these regulations start cropping up with greater frequency, but by 1441 there's a reference to a Christmas tree or maypole set up in front of a town hall in Tallinn, Estonia. In 1510 in Latvia there's a reference to a tree being decorated for Christmas with apples, thread, and straw, and in Estonia in 1514. 
And in all of these cases, these trees were not set up in private homes. The example from Freiburg was set up in a local hospital, the Tallinn example in front of a town hall, and the latter two examples from Latvia and Estonia were sponsored by merchant guilds. This leads the historian David Pertena to conclude that Christmas trees gain traction as guild-sponsored decorations for the public. Clear evidence for private Christmas trees doesn't emerge until the 1500s, again in the Alsace region, and by 1657 the practice was apparently so popular that it annoyed the Protestant theologian and Christmas tree killjoy, Johann Kondra Donhauer. He condemned them, saying, among other trifles which are set up during Christmas time instead of God's word is the Christmas tree, or fir tree, which is put up at home and decorated with dolls and sugar. Whence comes the custom I know not, it is child's play. Far better were it to point the children to the spiritual cedar tree, Jesus Christ. Again, we don't know why this practice caught on, but historians have floated the theory that the Christmas tree may have been partly inspired by another biblical story that famously features a tree, Adam and Eve eating the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Christians in medieval Europe would put on paradise plays, theatrical performances enacting the story of Adam and Eve for the largely illiterate masses. If you can't read the Bible stories for yourself, why not watch a stage play about them? These paradise plays generally don't have stage directions, so we don't really know how they would have set the stage, with the notable exception of a medieval paradise play from northern France, which describes having a tree with fruit on stage. Then shall a serpent, cunningly contrived, climb up the trunk of the forbidden tree. Eve shall put her ear up to it as if listening to its advice. Then Eve shall take the apple and offer it to Adam. There is good reason to believe that this was a widespread practice in paradise plays across northern France and Germany. And many of these plays were probably performed around Christmas. A cycle of medieval Christmas plays discovered among a German community in Hungary involved a decorated conifer tree as a prop on stage. Now, the forestry regulations from the 1300s and the 1400s do not mention paradise plays, but this is one possible inspiration for the practice. Or at least, paradise plays may have helped to popularize the Christmas tree via guild-sponsored performances. By the 1800s, the Christmas tree grew increasingly popular outside of Germany. The practice got a big boost in England from Queen Charlotte the German wife of King George III, who decorated Windsor Castle with a Christmas tree in the year 1800, and an image published by the Illustrated London News went viral in 1848, which showed Queen Victoria with her German husband Prince Albert with a Christmas tree. And with the help of German immigration and mass media, the Christmas tree took off in the United States. Within 500 years, what started as a curious practice in the Upper Rhine region had become a global Christmas phenomenon. So based on the available evidence, this is how I would summarize the origins of the Christmas tree. People in the Upper Rhine region started to set up and decorate Christmas trees or maypoles by the early 1400s. The earliest example dates to 1419 in the city of Freiburg. We can speculate that this tradition started earlier, perhaps in the 1300s. Forestry regulations from this period indicate that peasants were running into the evergreen forests of the Upper Rhine region to gather wood around Christmas. We don't know why they were doing this. It's possible that the evergreen branches were used as a Christmas time decoration earlier in the 1300s, but this is an educated guess. It's also possible that Christians in this region were inspired by stage plays about Adam and Eve that were performed in December that would have involved a decorated tree on stage. But our earliest evidence does not mention this, and it's also an educated guess. Again, the when and the where is fairly well established. The why is murky. Notice what I haven't mentioned. I have not mentioned the Romans, or a pagan festival called Yule, or a Norse sacred tree called Yggdrasil. And that's because I'm basing my summary on the available evidence. There is no evidence that any of these things had anything to do with the origins of the Christmas tree. Saturnalia was an ancient Roman festival honoring the god Saturn. It was held from the 17th to 23rd of December, though this changed throughout its history. As I describe in my Saturnalia video, it began with a mass public sacrifice at the Temple of Saturn, followed by several days of feasting, gambling, drinking, and most notably, the role reversal between enslaved people and their enslavers. A holiday when enslaved people were encouraged to dine with them or talk back to them, stuff like that. But out of all of the Roman sources that mention Saturnalia, there is absolutely no mention that the ancient Romans decorated anything with evergreen branches or trees to celebrate this holiday. Not a single reference from a single Roman source. Anyone who says otherwise is making stuff up. 
So what about pre-Christian Germanic practice, or Norse mythology? A few have pointed to the legend of Saint Boniface, who according to an 8th century legend cut down a sacred oak tree, Thor's oak, and used the wood to build a church. The argument goes something like this. The Germans apparently viewed trees as sacred, and thus the Christmas tree is a vestige of pagan sacred tree veneration. There is some evidence that people in Europe venerated sacred groves. One of the more interesting examples I found is from the writings of the Christian bishop Caesarius, who lived during the 500s in southern France. In his sermons, he's constantly complaining about his parishioners going off to the sacred groves. But conducting religious rituals in or around trees or viewing certain trees as sacred doesn't prove direct cultural transmission to the very particular custom of setting up and decorating evergreen trees for a winter festival. Sacred groves and sacred trees are a generic enough religious practice seen across the world, from North America to Africa to Asia, and assuming that the story of Thor's Oak contains any shred of historicity that could shed light on actual ancient religious practice, there's little to connect this story with Christmas or Christmas trees. No mention that Boniface's attack occurred around Christmas time. No mention if it was an evergreen tree or was decorated. Nothing that would connect this story to the birth of Jesus. So what about Yule? The scholar Peter Gainsford has a great overview of Yule over at his blog Kiwi Hellenist. But to quickly summarize, Yule is first mentioned as the name of a month on a Christian calendar of Christian saints days dating to the 500s. The Christian monk Bede also mentions Yule and refers to it as part of the name of two different months on the English calendar, corresponding to our December and January on the Gregorian calendar. Dr. Gainsford thinks this is perhaps more suggestive of Yule referring to a season rather than a festival. Though Norse texts dating to the 800s and later do describe a Yule festival, but these sources don't reference a tree or log as part of the celebrations. Rather, Yule festivals involved making vows, feasting, and a sacred boar, presumably for consuming during all that feasting. The earliest evidence we have for burning a Yule log comes from Christian sources dating to the late 12th century that explicitly reference burning wood on Christmas. So I'd agree with Dr. Gainsford when he says it's probably best to call the Yule log a Christmas log since the practice seems to have emerged from medieval Christian Europe. When your favorite influencer says that the Christmas tree originates from pre-Christian Germanic paganism, they're inadvertently parroting ideas invented without evidence by 19th century German nationalist writers. In 1858, the Protestant writer Johannes Marbach published a study on Christmas arguing that German Christmas was a fusion of pagan and Christian practices rooted in what he calls primordial German soil. He wrote the intimate connection of Germandom with Christendom inspired a new era for the German Volk, demonstrated by the tree of Christ. In other words, the Christmas tree and other German folk customs, which he believed were pre-Christian, helped to forge a new identity for the German people. A few decades later, the German philosopher Alexander Till wrote the lights of the Christmas tree shine as far as the German tongue is spoken, from the east of Prussia to Alsatia, from the Baltic and the German Ocean to the south of the Danube. Elsewhere, he complains that non-German people who've adopted the Christmas tree are degrading the practice. Writers like him were publishing with an explicitly nationalist agenda, constructing a German identity that tied the modern Germans with a mythical past. German Christmas customs like the Christmas tree were held up as an example of that prehistoric national identity. All this to say the Christmas tree does seem to originate from some sort of folk custom. In 14th century Alsace, peasants were apparently gathering branches from the forests around Christmas time, possibly to decorate their houses. By the 15th century, people in this region were setting up and decorating Christmas trees and maypoles. This much is firmly established, but it's a huge leap to call this a pre-Christian folk custom. Our earliest Christmas tree is 1419, hundreds of years after the Christianization of the region, and the practice appears somewhat suddenly in history. There is no chain of evidence that could link this practice to ancient or late ancient practice. Rather, it seems to have emerged from Christian communities to celebrate a Christian holiday. When it comes to religious studies, this time of year is a misinformation free-for-all. And the misinformation often splits along ideological lines. Christian apologists and the all of Christmas is pagan crowd battling it out online, publishing falsehoods that align with their own ideological bias. Ideological bias clouds so much of the information that we consume online, and one of my favorite tools to cut through the mess is the sponsor of this video, Ground News. Ground News is a website and app that gives readers an easy, data-driven, and objective way to read the news. 
So for example, let's pull up a news story. A recent Pew Research poll has found that nearly half of teenagers say that they are online almost constantly. Ground News gives you a quick visual breakdown of the political bias of the sources reporting on the story. Here we see 27% of the sources are left-leaning and one right-leaning source covering this story. Every story also comes with a breakdown of who owns the media sources. As in, are these sources funded independently, by governments, or media conglomerates? And each story comes with a factuality rating, which is backed by ratings from three independent news monitoring organizations. My favorite tool is the blind spot feed. This highlights stories that are disproportionately covered by one side of the political spectrum or the other. Here we see a story on the US national debt surpassing $100,000 per person, and it's covered almost exclusively by right-leaning sources. And a story on the United Nations Climate Summit COP28 is covered almost exclusively by left-leaning sources. Below each story, you can see a readout of the partisan coverage. I like this tool because we all live in our own echo chambers online, our own filter bubbles, and those bubbles are invisible to us unless we try to become aware of them. And the blind spot feed in particular can help achieve that awareness. Subscribe to Ground News using my link ground.news slash religion for breakfast. And now's the time to subscribe because Ground News is offering a holiday sale, their best deal of the year. You'll get 40% off their Vantage plan, which includes unlimited access to their app, website, and newsletters for just $5 a month. So sign up today and help support an independent platform working to make the media landscape more transparent.